in Sorry about that. Welcome, everybody. Um, so my name is Doug Bruggeman. I'm uh, the president of Echo School Services Markets, and I'm, I'm hosting the Zoom series. And um, I came to this idea after serving on the USGS Species Accrediting Toolbox, and also uh, serving on the board of uh, directors for the National Environmental Banking Association. And it just struck me that, you know, how much the community really wants species banking to work and to really extend, um, extend, create new markets and become more efficient. And it just seemed to me that we needed to have better conversations and conversations across the private sector, public sector and, and the nonprofits as well. So I thought I'd, I'd create that opportunity and reached out and um, to folks and create a steering committee, thanks to Greg DeYoung, Sarah Johnson, Donna Collier and, and Craig Denisoff for helping me get this started um, to hopefully, you know, create some community and have some discussion. It looks like we might have a chance to have some updated species mitigation guidance in the near future. So I humbly hope that maybe what we're starting here can lead to good discussions and some good guidance uh, moving forward. And so my tremendous gratitude for Travis Henman for volunteering to be the first uh, presenter are kicking us off with a very provocative talk. He's the Vice President of Western Belt Ecological Services. And so how we're going to structure this today, given that we're trying to do, you know, conversations on species credits over Zoom with a lot of people, we're going to give Travis time to give a brief presentation. And then during that time, I would ask you to write your questions in the um, chat box to the community, to everyone. And then once Travis is done, we'll start reading off those questions. And then I imagine a, a conversation will evolve. And if we are not able to get to your written questions, we will make sure to email you the response. So with that, um, I'm gonna make Travis the host and let Travis take it away. Do you need anything else, Travis, for me? No, I don't think so. But as you guys watch me struggle with technology, you can shout out sort of advice, but I'm pretty sure I have to share my screen, right? Correct. Then I'm good to go. One, one comment I would make on uh, Doug for logistics, I would love to uh, have us, you know, keep all the questions that we get or Doug gets uh, we'll keep a document of the responses because I, just like Doug said, I think this conversation has been going on for years upon years, uh, but I think we need to really focus that and say, what do we really want to get accomplished here for species markets? How do we really take these questions, provide answers to those questions, and then how do we do, actually do something? It's, it's very difficult. And, and by the way, I'm the greatest first speaker ever because I am so simple-minded. I'm originally from Iowa. I'm gonna boil everything down to its simplest form. And then we can have the real experts, the real technical people figured out. But I will be there in the background shouting, please keep this simple. We're never gonna get anywhere if we get way too complicated. So I think my first presentation is a good sort of general kickoff onto this topic of species market. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, like Doug said, I'm going to make it pretty brief because we want to have a conversation, but, uh, you know, I've got some overview uh, slides that I'd like to present to kick this off. Can you guys see my screen so far? Yes. It's a little bit slow, so just bear with me here. All right, so I, you know, I entitled this 
presentation, really conservation banking, make me a market. And Doug has known me for a few years now, and I'm, I'm definitely sort of a pessimist at times. I can be pretty grumpy. But if I'm going to be grumpy all the time, I thought, well, I should probably talk about how we actually find some solutions here. So let's, let's not complain the whole time. Let's talk about what does make me a market look like since, you know, we'd like it to be a market. So let's talk about it. So real quick, um, again, my presentation is going to be relatively brief, but I wanted to, I always give a disclaimer. I've got some clarity and cleanup that I wanted to talk about in terms of some of the things that I think we just are confusing in the markets today. I'll talk about the species markets as they exist today and some regulations, where do we need to go? And then obviously it'll be an open, open question. So my big disclaimers for this whole talk is that, you know, I am a habitat banker or the, our company is, but I don't believe in the banking model for species yet. I, I, I don't believe in the model. I think there's a lot of work to be done before we can really uh, move forward with that. I also say that I will be giving investment advice. I will be giving investment advice. Don't bank property without talking to me first. So the other one is, hold on, let me move my speaker view here. So the presentation is really for advanced practitioners, but uh, it's gonna be fun. And what I mean by that, uh, I'm gonna get into sort of concepts that hopefully are not too far in the stratosphere, but you know, I, I'm gonna, it's, it's for advanced discussions. People have been around long enough for this discussion. They should understand the majority of what I'm talking about. I promised not to be too pessimistic here. And also I really need to write a book, but I just don't like writing that much because I have a lot to say and I can, I can talk for hours on this subject. After this meeting, if you want to just call me, I won't shut up because I really do love talking about uh, the mitigation industry. So here are some of my thoughts about when I talk about clarity and cleanup, and this is what I think we all need to sort of get our heads around when we talk about species marketing or, or species banking. There is a massive confusion that I believe is getting better, but I run up against it almost every week that wetland mitigation and species mitigation simply are just not the same. So people have this perception that conservation banking, wetland banking, it's all the same deal. It's all the same type of investments. It's offsets. Let's generalize offsets. Let's generalize biodiversity offsets. It's simply not true. The federal reg regulations that um, sort of drive the wetland market uh, to, into the 2008 wetland mitigation rule, that really was the springboard for, for the market. And now people are able to rely on that. It's definitely not perfect. But it is why you see wetlands and stream banks nationally, and it is why you don't see species banking taking off nationally. Every time I go back to DC, I often get, the, I get that question from, from policymakers, regulators, well, why isn't species banking national? Why aren't you doing it all over in every state? And it's for this very reason, and we all know that as an industry, this is what we have to focus on, is regulation, the underpinning of the market. Also, the complexity, you know, I, I say that species mitigation, quite frankly, is not rocket science at all. There's a lot of science behind it. There's a lot of details, but really it's way easier than technical wetland restoration, construction, creating wetlands. There's a big level of technical work that is required in general. And I will say in general, and I will use that phrase a lot during my talk, in general, in general, species banking is not that complicated. Some species can get pretty complicated like giant garter snake where you're constructing wetlands out of, out of a rice field to make managed marsh systems. But in general, species mitigation is not complex construction. And I always say this, general investors are still confused. Every day we get new investors in, interested in this industry and this is the very first thing that holds them up. One of the other things, conservation is mitigation, depending on the driver. I, I hear a lot of people say um, mitigation generally means wetlands and conservation generally means species, but both are conserved. So conservation in and of itself, when you're doing it for species is actually mitigation. 
And sometimes I pick on habitat conservation plans. I'm getting along better with them now, but they like to say that we are beyond mitigation. We also include conservation measures. And when you really look at what they do in a landscape, which I support landscape level planning, they're doing conservation, but it is for mitigation. So it, it gets confusing, but I, but I wanted to make the comment that just because something is conf conservation doesn't mean it's not mitigation. And so, and mitigation is, is never just conservation or it shouldn't be because sometimes people say, I put an easement on something, that's my offset. If it truly is mitigation, you have to remember the other assurances, endowments, long-term management, adaptive management, monitoring, those key elements really what make mitigation. We can't lose sight of that when we're doing uh, conservation. Uh, one of the one of the statements you hear in our industry, and I think you've heard this for over 20 years, and I love it because it's so simple. And I would say possibly the godfather of this statement might be Denisov, who's on the phone. But I loved hear him hearing him say business and biology, business and biology. It's very simple. It's very catchy. It's true when you think about you know wetlands. It's it's the way to say it, but it confuses people in the conservation banking world because they think, oh, I got a great piece of land. I got some money, I'm gonna invest in it. They forget about the third B that's not there, which is bureaucracy or regulation. So it's not just the balance of business and biology. We need the regulation behind it too. But it's less catchy. I mean, I like business and biology, but it's less catchy to say business, biology, and bureaucracy. But we got to start thinking that way when we think about mitigation markets. So species markets today, it's really important to have a, a look at what's really going on. And they suck. So, and this is uh, my personal communication with myself since 2008. They're terrible. They're terrible because they're inconsistent and it always comes, it does come back to this. They're just literally not regulation behind them. However, here's an illustration of how I feel that species mitigation is going these days. A picture is worth a thousand world, words. So. This is my depiction of what's going on. There are unicorns out there, there are scary cats with guns, and there are some rainbows out there. And everybody, when I say that, people will get a little bit hyper and say, well, wait a minute, I, I have a great well, I have a great species project. Or Travis, don't you doesn't your company invest millions of dollars in species project? That makes no sense that you say they suck. There's always a good unicorn example out there in probably every state. Every state probably has a species offset that occurred that ended up being a great deal for an NGO, an investor, an, an applicant, a government regulator. So there's always really good examples of a project that actually worked and, and people really wanna hang their hat on them. But scalability, um, consistency, replicating that is very difficult. Uh, turnkeys for species mitigation can be really, really good. And turnkeys are build to suit. You guys all on the call knows, know what they are, but there are some build to suit projects for species that are wonderful and they're great. Uh, they're not mitigation or conservation banks. They're not species banks. There's also some very successful species banks that just hit the mar market correctly. Uh, the regulators supported the project. There was a big back, uh, backlog of need and it worked out. So that, that's really exciting. There are unicorn examples out there, but I would like to say it really does. And this is what's scary from an investment standpoint. It depends on sometimes individual regulators and those individuals can drive decisions that benefit a, a conservation project, a mitigation project, but it has nothing to do with the regulations since, since they don't exist in the species market. But we've had some success um, in areas where we did species mitigation and an individual regulator drove the market for us, ended up making a great habitat restoration or habitat species project. Uh, and it's a success, but it was because of an individual regulator, not because of the regulation. So regulations, where do we need to go? Um, this is where I would love to be very simple. 
as an organization, as an industry, because if we, if we don't, it's gonna be a challenge. But where do we need to go? We were close. During the Obama administration, there was um, a, a, a guidance or, ordinate or policy that came out that was very closely tied to the 2008 wetland mitigation rule. There's definitely improvements that we need to make um, in, some of those, uh, in some of those conditions of that rule but we just need to follow what they did in the 2008 wetland mitigation rule as a basis and then build from there and have improvements from there. Actually, I think in some regards, it's gonna be easier than the wetlands rule. Uh, this is the biggest trick I think is you gotta keep it extremely simple and straightforward. Uh, for example, I always say one credit is equal to one acre of conserved land supporting the target species. Don't overcomplicate that with functional assessments and multipliers and ratios and all that other stuff. Acre for acre, to be honest, we're in a race against time when it comes to protecting lands that need to be protected and getting into some of that minutia is just gonna slow down some of the conservation efforts. We need conservation easements as the instrument. We need long-term management plans. We need endowments. This is exactly in line with what what is currently in the 2008 mitigation rule. So we need those assurances in place for species mitigation markets, and we need those to be required. Um, we also need to set realistic performance standards, and I'm talking about the regulators need to do that. You have to balance accountability with flexibility on managing these landscapes. Don't overburden the investor with over cumbersome sort of monitoring standards or performance standards that you'll never meet because the investor will die. You just gotta make sure it's great habitat, the species is present uh, and it's being taken care of. And there's money to do that. Keep it consistent. Um, it's really important in, in regulated markets. I, I say follow recovery plans, just like wetlands, watershed plans. Follow recovery plans if you have them for species, respect service areas when you can. Um, support approved credits is huge. I would say the rule, uh, if we have ever a rule for species, we've got to have a strong preference for advanced credits that are invested in. We also have to set very clear impact standards and ratios for the regulated community so they understand what they're getting into uh, when they enter a regulated market for a species. Uh, the regulated market I have found is actually quite advanced and evolved, and they're okay with paying for offsets if they know what they are. When they don't know what the market looks like and they can't budget and they're struggling, they will end up having to hire attorneys and lobbyists to fight everything. And then all of a sudden you don't have compensation or compensatory mitigation moving forward because they could not plan for it accordingly. So they have to fight it. Keep it moving. Regulatory timelines for approval, I think, are critical. Investors looking at investing in species markets really want to understand what the timeline is. And having some assurance from an entitlement standpoint is really important. You got to know that you can get in and out of that system if you have a good project in 12 months, 24 months, something reasonable. Uh, you cannot sit and spin in sort of uh, decision uh, constipation forever. That, that gets, gets you nowhere and it kills, kills really good projects. I also would say it's upon the industry to make sure we're bringing forward good projects. Um, that's critical. But when you do bring a good project forward, it's hard to see uh, it sit there and struggle. Regulatory timelines for credit releases is important. Uh, making sure that you're not held up if you've met all the standards um, and the requirements. And this is kind of a bold, interesting idea. I've thought about it. Uh, I know there's a lot of um, potential hair on this, but explore a time cap for advanced mitigation investments. What if after a decade or 15 years, you had a bunch of unsold inventory that you could receive support or help from the government? What if you could do that? That would add huge amount of investor interest because they can then put a backstop to their investment. And that potentially could be very helpful for this market. One of the issues would be what price do you set? But I think you can get around that. But I do think having something like that as a safety net would be, would be really important. 
man, I always say resist creativity. Creativity in compensatory mitigation markets uh, kills really good, solid mitigation solutions. Um, it's not rocket science. We know it works and doesn't work. But when agencies start blessing things that they think are kind of fun and interesting, maybe scientific or even planning related, uh, they really kill on the ground restoration or conservation projects. So I, you know, I always say that planning does not equal compensatory mitigation. I, I used to be a regulated applicant and I've even had um, my employer, which was a home builder, ask if we could just put up a science experiment to see if we could get it approved instead of going doing a true offset. Um, and they were considering it. So we just have to be careful about too, being too creative uh, in solutions when it comes for land offsets. Um, this has been a big topic lately, and I'm very careful the way I couch this. Conservation on public land is terrible. I would say if not managed correctly, and I always like to be like black and white, like it's terrible, we should never do it, it's horrible, don't even talk to me about it. I do believe you can do it successfully, but I would like to put um, some sideboards on exactly when that can be done, because I think it's a very dangerous slippery slope. And at one point when they were, we were working on legislation for, or language for uh, the species, for species mitigation uh, under the Obama administration, this came up. It was, I remember this debate about no net loss versus net benefit. And for some reason that triggered a bunch of different groups. It was a long debate. And I thought, this is crazy. Like, I don't even understand what no net loss means when it comes to conservation and, and species. Net benefit even so sounds even more crazy because we're trying to protect against land-based loss and we're always losing land. So we have to conserve what we've got in areas with species that we know we wanna protect. And so anyway, I thought we, that we went down a rabbit hole there and I feel like we should have just focused on what's really good for species recovery and how do we focus on endangered species. And I think Doug mentioned this, and I do think this is really important. Um, I always say conservation doesn't really care where the money comes from. It doesn't actually care if it comes from the government, an NGO, or a for-profit. But conservation, good compensatory mitigation requires investment. It requires dollars. We, we know this stuff costs money. And so we all need to work together. And there are more than enough roles in all of this industry to make sure we all, we all get to do what we love to do and we can do it successfully. And I will be a big champion of just keeping projects simple if we can, because I, I do believe simple, straightforward projects uh, are, are really great projects. And I think that is the end for my very, very brief presentation. I did put in just some rambling uh, last minute sort of hot topic-y type thoughts that I had. I've heard of species translocation lately for, for species banking projects. I think it's a slippery slope. Uh, I was reminded of that the other day when I had a conversation with some agencies. Um, monitoring, and, and California has 20 years ahead of the, of the U.S., and we've kind of started to see the pendulum go too far the other way. Monitoring is great, over monitoring is a conservation killer. And so we're dealing with that in California quite a bit and we need to make sure what is the right balance here. But I think monitoring is definitely a hot topic. Um, modifying the, let's, we, can't, we have to acknowledge that modifying the Endangered Species Act, uh, the darling environmental, um, regulation is very, very, very challenging. There is a lot of anxiety on both sides, any side on touching that um, act. So for us to do that, I think is gonna be extremely difficult. I think it's important. I think there probably does need to be rules and or regulation around ESA at some point. It has to be timed appropriately. It is not gonna be easy as hard as we try to make it or keep it easy. And the last one is just endowments are important. And everybody on the call, I hope, knows what a long-term stewardship endowment it is. It's basically the babysitting money for habitat projects. And I am finding out more and more that um, robust 
good, reasonable endowments are so critical if we actually want to have projects uh, that we're proud of and that um, make sense and actually are financially viable for the long, long term. So endowments are really critical and I wouldn't want to lose that in the species banking uh, markets. And that's it. Now I'm ready for questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Travis. That gives us a lot to, um, to discuss. Uh, thanks for bringing up those, uh, those meaty topics for us to jump into. And um, just to let you guys know, I've not received any, uh, any questions in the chat box. So it strikes me you guys want to chat. Um, so you guys can unmute yourselves. And uh, if it gets too busy, I'll just ask you to raise your hand. But I think we're with this crowd, I think we'll be okay. Um, so I'll start out with a question for, for Travis. So you mentioned the difference with, between the wetland banking and species banking in that the species banking just is not, um, can't be replicated as easily. So are you saying that it can't be replicated as easily because it's so de more heavily dependent on relationships or, or is it the lack of regulation? No, it's literally just the lack, the lack of regulation there. I mean, wetland banking now has, you know, decades of learning lessons learned. It's it's got the strength of the 2008 mitigation rule that is the blue book for doing it. It definitely needs improvements. I think we all see that. But but everybody is is pretty okay and understands the recipe for delivery of wetland mitigation. Species mitigation is just not uh, common talk across the country. Um, in fact, there are regulators nationally that don't feel like you can even ask for it. They don't know how to ask for it. They think um, it's potentially extortion. I mean, there's a lot of issues with getting um, everybody nationally comfortable with ESA mitigation. Right. Great, thank you. And that's and the other hard part is when you're talking about wetlands, water is water. I mean, I know landscapes are different, but when we talk about ESA, that every species is definitely different. Habitats are different. And so there's got to be a lot of science and discussion on every species and what is right, what's the ideal, what's the correct uh, sort of habitat type. W wetlands, you can actually make it a lot more uniform when it comes to wetlands. Right. So anybody else have a question for Travis? Yeah, Travis, George Kelly, thanks so much for, for convening and Doug, thanks for convening the conversation. Um, wondering whether either or both of you have seen Tim Mayo's epic report on ESA mitigation and improvements and they have a lot of near-term suggestions, including reinstating the 2016 uh, Fish and Wildlife Mitigation Policy, the ESA policy, um, looking at the 2003 Conservation Banking Enhancement scenario, but it seems like reinstating the 2016 policies is a, is a, a good first step for us to consider. W wanted to hear your thoughts on that. The other thing is for the California folks on, I've always said that one of the reasons why California is at least the stronger market in other places is because CEQA also seems to drive the species side of the equation. Um, and that the ESA, Travis, to your point, is just not a very good tool for driving a lot of the conservation. It's very limited and doesn't have the language we need, et cetera. And you're not gonna change that. But are there, you know, have we seen, you know, the, the state law like a CEQA to me has been one of the main reasons you see, you know, species such an active issue in California. Two, two questions to the folks. Yeah, so first question, the Tim Mail paper, I did read it. I did provide feedback on it. The only thing that made me anxious about it was it started to include a lot of other things um, that were on the fringe of species banking and conservation mitigation, basically, or species mitigation. So, I mean, it, it was good. I just worry about it. Um, turning into a Christmas tree where everybody's trying to hang a bunch of stuff on it and then it gets more confusing. So um, I think there were comments about, um, you know, like even, you know, HCPs or RCISs and other programs and, um, 
in voluntary species areas. I mean, we've got to get really focused on one area and get it right instead of talking about a lot of WAFA program. I mean, there was a lot of other things that were starting to leak into the paper that made me, made me nervous and we could lose focus. The, the states being actively involved in this, yeah, that's huge. I mean, California is, California is nuts, but California is nuts for a reason. And uh, that means there's opportunity for us for solutions. But uh, California CESA laws are very, very strong. CEQA laws, very, very strong. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity with states stepping in. Um, as long as they wanna follow a recipe that we can all follow, it, it could be very good. Yeah, but one thing on the Tim uh, report, I think is a pretty simple idea, which is 2016 mitigation policies, reinstate them. Um, and yep. it doesn't take a, a heavy lift on that front. Um, I, I, I agree with you. You don't want a Christmas tree dynamic either. But uh, yeah, I, I think that two thousand. I mean, the, the 2016 policy, I think it also made mention about the whole public land thing in there too. And I got nervous about that. And I was like, okay, let's, I don't want to go down that slope, but, but yeah, from, from a starting point. Yeah. Let's start from a good base. That was, we were there. Many of you on the call, I think were probably um, involved in sort of trying to get that over the finish line. And we're, we're pretty excited as an industry when we saw it come out and then to have the lights shut off on it was probably pretty depressing. <laughs> it was depressing. Yeah, I, I would agree. Starting with the 2016 Fish and Wildlife Risk Mitigation Rule would be a good place to start. I, you know, as you know, George, I do a lot of work with fragmentation, and they actually mentioned fragmentation for a change. It was like, you know, I, I thought that was great, but they left it very open. So, you know, just like the public lands issue, I'd like to see that explored in more detail. So, guys, we, we're getting some comments written, and I'm going to give those people some air. So a, a question from uh, Nathan Wojcik, apologies for if I didn't get the name right. So he's familiar with working with a, with a habitat exchange where there's a debitor and a, a creditor for mitigation impacts and an administrative body overseeing and managing the entire transaction. And the administrative body, body usually operates under agreement that can take years to set up and, and provides input by multiple stakeholders. Does the same sort of setup apply to species credits? That system scares me because I don't understand it. I'm not smart enough. It it seems wildly creative, but I get nervous about. I don't know. I you know to me it sounds like the stock exchange, and I'd love to be educated on it instead of being negative. I just I literally it makes me nervous, and I'd love to talk offline about it. From species mitigation, um, I mean, there's a lot of people involved from a collaboration standpoint, once you actually identify a project that you're actually gonna conserve and then ultimately sell credits off of. And, and then that's run through a system where you get credits and then it's open to the general market to go ahead and satisfy their offsets at that bank, either a state permit or a federal permit, federal biological opinion or a state uh, take permit. So, um, the nice thing about the banking system is, uh, again, you have a very specific project that you're driving forward to get crediting on. The exchange program to me just seems a little bit more abstract. To me, there's a little bit more risk in, in, in some of that, but I, I, again, I wanna know more about it. I, I just generally scared me because it sounded overly creative. No, and I appreciate that, Travis. Uh, I, I appreciate the elements you presented here. And I think with these exchanges, what happens is you see the lack of implementation or you know, businesses, operators buying into it because there is that paralysis because of the complexity and the creativity. So the elements you presented here were fantastic and really good to chew upon. So yeah, perhaps we could find each other offline and uh, chat a little bit more. Yeah, I'd love it. And anybody doing something outside of species banking, just please forgive me for my sort of directness or grumpiness or whatever. I, I just, if I don't understand, then I'll come off as kind of gruff, but uh, I'd love to learn more about all of it because I, I think it could be important. I just want to make sure that we don't set something up or there aren't programs that don't do what they say they're going to do. And then all of a sudden, everybody says species mitigation doesn't work. 
and then they then they also say, oh yeah, I think that's driven by the private sector and they don't work either. We need it to work. So uh, I, I think that's just my only caveat is I get, my knee jerk reaction is to be anxious, but I would love to talk to you more about it so I can learn. Great, so before we move on to the next written question, are there more comments on the Habitat Exchange contrast? Okay. We can, hey, real quick, that's a fun study. I would love someone to do a habitat exchange, um, sort of uh, a, uh, an analogy of, okay, here's the banking program, here's an exchange program. Like what are the similarities, what are the differences and what are the challenges? Because I, I don't know enough about it, but it fascinating topic, but um, put it out there to see where an apple, an apple or an orange or an apple looks like. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And uh, you know, we've had the opportunity to work on both sides. In, in both exchanges and banks. And the lessons learned and the differences are um, quite obvious. So I think it'd be really helpful, you know, if it's a wide degree paper, we could put it out there for all the practitioners to consider. Got it. Great. All right, so the next question from, from Dana Herman. Regarding regulation, this is more of a comment than a question. The uh, fiscal year 21 uh, National Defense Authorization Act includes a provision directing the service to issue regulations on mitigation banking. The bill requires an ANPR, which I'm not sure what that is, within a year um, of the bill's enactment. Our headquarters is working on this issue now. The language in the bill calls for, to the maximum ex extent practicable, the regulatory standards and criteria shall maximize available credits and opportunities for mitigation, provide flexibility for characteristics of various species, and apply equivalent standards and criteria to all mitigation banks. So it sounds like good language. I've not read that yet and look forward to seeing it. Thank you for the comment, Dana. Yeah, I included a link in a later comment where you guys okay. discuss the bill itself and look at all of the language. But um, someone else on the call, I know there's several service people on the call might know more and be closer to this, but um, it sounds like we're starting with republishing um, the policies that were withdrawn and starting with the 2016 versions, looking at those as a start and moving forward with the policies and then on to regulation. So that was just something you were talking about, Travis, and I, I don't know how widely that information is distributed outside of the service. I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware. No, we're, as an industry, we're really excited to just generally see the language. And now we have to say, okay, how do we get that implemented in the field? And what's it really mean to the ground or on the ground? And I, I will just say, because Dan is on the call, the, the Sacramento office is really, for us, one of the epicenters of banking. I mean, they've taken the lead in the state. They actually know what they're doing. Um, and I'm, I am brown nosing a little bit, but we get projects through them because they actually know what they're doing and they have technical staff to get through the process. So um, there is a lot of conservation banking in Northern California because of the Sacramento Field Office of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they're excited to see conservation go uh, in the ground. Great. So the next uh, uh, question from uh, Tyler Bell is about monitoring. Is the typical monitoring approach in California to assess habitat or species presence? Thank you, Tyler, for that question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, um, you know, there has been lately an extreme focus on species, um, not, not just species present, and I, and I can appreciate this, but like species population numbers, like individuals. And I know the data is important. And I think from a species banking perspective, one, we have to prove that the species is there, that the habitat that they're utilizing is a viable long-term habitat. However, I do not think that we need to monitor um, population every year, exact numbers, because at some point you're bothering them too much. And I know the data could be interesting to say, hey, if can we find, you know, four, four individuals and how about now six individuals and what about three females and two males and how about they're in the water and how about, you know, I've been around those discussions where I get from the science perspective, it's fascinating. And maybe there's some voluntary scientific studies we can do. 
But if that monitoring becomes a performance standard that's required for credit releases or success, all of a sudden you're choking the banker and the investment because it gets so stressful to have to find and really fund aggressive studies for monitoring. But, but I believe species is very important and I don't think it can be potential habitat. That's just my rigid view of banking. If we are gonna buy and protect property, let's do it on the best property that we know the species exist and, and are there and using it. Um, I, I've seen proposals for banks that say, well, it's potential. I'm like, well, that's not good enough. We wanna be the best and that is verifying that the species is there. Okay, so um, thanks for that. And uh, so the next question is by Wayne Walker. Uh, Travis, what kind of experience have you had with HCPs in regard to cutting our conservation banks and cutting out our conservation banks? And why does this happen? Yeah, Wayne, that's a great. <laughs> Wayne wants me to talk for like two hours. Um, you know, I, HCPs are, you know, um, really good habitat conservation planning efforts that are often sort of sponsored by local jurisdictions. And the issue that has occurred is that they are respecting their jurisdictional boundaries when they're doing HCPs. And oftentimes those jurisdictional boundaries don't respect our existing service areas. So we, we've have projects approved on recovery plan areas. So larger service areas. But if an HCP is approved and they're approved in a specific jurisdiction, they will then drive the mitigation and the projects to their program. I.e. they cannot buy, in general, they're not allowed to buy credits or they're not allowing to buy credits in an area of our service area that we historically had. So that was my biggest issue that I was that I was dealing with is if you have a habitat project species project that physically sits out of an outside of an HCP area, but they get approved inside your service area, they would cut your market. And we've gotten around it a little bit by working directly with the HCPs and then becoming implementers for them on projects in their area, but it still didn't help the fact that it affected our existing project. So that's a very, very difficult issue uh, to, to deal with. And it's, it's not resolved, to be frank. And Doug, if I could just jump in there, um, that, that's a great example of what happens with a lot of munis, counties, et cetera. But we've seen in region two and six is that HCPs, CCAAs, 4D rules, are sometimes developed by design to exclude banks. They, they don't have a statement on the cover that says we don't like banks, but they, they come up with their own ways to define debits and credits that are proprietary. Nobody understands it. You know, you heard the keep it simple message earlier, acres based from Travis, I couldn't echo that more. And it's really just a sophisticated play a lot, a lot of times by, um, applicants or administrators to try to achieve a lower compliance price point at the detriment of the species. So um, it's something that needs to be fixed. It's something that's different from the wetland and stream world. Uh, it's something that I hope the 2016 guidance will help fix if it's put back in place. It's, a, it's another reason why we have to have a rule to get these markets from not sucking anymore. So just yeah, kind of yeah, one one solution that might work, I've thought about a lot, which is, um, you know, having any credits that are in an HCP area somehow get a contract with that local sponsor that those credits then are absorbed into the market as a first uh, flush. Um, the issue is they have to make sure they charge accordingly. And it's been one of my, one of, I, I've been working a lot. It's been one of my challenges uh, with uh, HCPs and in Luffy programs is really making sure they charge the right amount of money. And so instead of complaining about it, which I've done for over a decade, I've actually worked pretty closely with them on what does it really cost to restore a wetland or a stream or do a habitat project in your area? Like, let's just look at the land cost associated with that. And I think they've done a great job of improving that, at least in our area, but other areas I've seen ILFs or 
um, funds or HCPs approved and the, and the fees look really low, very difficult to implement on a promise. And this just highlights Adam Rigsby has a, you know, basically had made the same point that Wayne just made that with um, the exchanges, you often get cheap mitigation that he feels that, you know, you get what you pay for and then you get end up with subpar conservation. So just Adam's perspective there. And then a question from Stephanie Maines. Um, and when exchange credits are for term or temporary agreements, there's no lasting investment value for permanent impacts to species habitat. So it's a, so she feels it's a big shell game. Um, so, I mean, a lot of issues ahead of us and, you know, clear need to get um, some guidance, some guidance down. Um, be happy to open it up for, for further comments and perspectives now. So Doug, real quick, what are some of the other topics that you're considering um, hosting here? Is this just a species or is this mitigation industry in general? Yeah, thanks for that question, Travis. I really want to focus on species crediting issues, be it, you know, HCPs, uh, habitat exchanges, banking. Um, and I just feel like there's been an explosion of ideas, mostly policy ideas, and um, without a lot of clarity um, in terms of federal decision making. So some of you know, I, I kind of entered this field kind of sideways with the recreated woodpecker in 2006. And the Fish and Wildlife Service was saying that the military could not trade RCW habitat because acre doesn't equal acre for RCWs. Hmm. And I had a method for recognizing that acres often don't equal acres for species and incorporating habitat fragmentation. And so that's how I got to first to know George Kelly because uh, George was like, well, we don't want, you know, Doug doing studies, we want to create some mitigation. And so I've been involved in this kind of, you know, edge here for a while. And, you know, as I talk to Fish and Wildlife Service folks, I find that a lot of them are very uncertain about the uncertainty associated with mitigation banking. Um, what's, what's the uncertainties about it? The uncertainty that it's going to contribute to the species conservation. And so, you know, they because often they, they don't feel that an acre is an acre for the species. And so, you know, when that works and when you can when you can sell that, you, then you get these rainbow conditions. And so I'm, you know, working to, you know, try to help you guys. And I've had, you know, good success working with the feds and um, a little bit of success working with mitigation bankers. And I'm just trying to find a way forward because I, I know there's a lot of capital on the sidelines waiting to invest in to healthy species. And so I'd like to, you know, uh, find a way to move, move it forward. Um, so I wanna have a, you know, an open dialogue about crediting for species within a regulatory uh, framework. Well, uh, but I mean, is my oversimplification of acre for acre too simple? Because again, I feel like if you're protecting an acre that you can qualify as a fully protected acre that uh, is targeted to the species, is proven out to be important and sustainable for the species, then that that's great. I, and I don't really want a multiplier for it, or I don't. I mean, I, I think that's the I think that's the starting point. At some point, those low hanging fruits are going to go away, though. And then you might have to look outside of that, but let's make sure we pick the low hanging fruits in the industry first and, and set them up as the platinum uh, for recovery. Yeah, I mean, for sure, um, Habitat Acre, Acres contributes to population recovery, right? That's a no brainer. But there are many other things that contribute to species recovery and delisting that will reduce liability on landowners and the species. So, Let's see, we got one more question. 
Um, yes, so Kelly Jorgensen says, yes, acre for acre doesn't work for riverine settings and the quantity of habitat is not the same as high quality habitat. So, you know, clearly as often is done that, you know, you incorporate um, habitat quality as a, as a factor. You know, and so the thing is, you know, the systems are complex and, you know, how do you, you know, how do you manage the complexity in a way that keeps the cash flow going? And I feel like, you know, we've had good initial success with the concept and now to expand it, there are some things we're gonna have to really hammer out. And so I hope that this community can come together and, and we can do that partially here. So I, I real quick though, I mean, I'm totally fascinated by that comment about acre for acre doesn't work for riverine settings. And I'm just like, well, I can calculate what an acre of riverine is, but I understand the second part of that, which is quantity of habitat is not the same as high quality habitat. I, I think my main point is let's make sure we're, we're, we're permitting credits on high quality habitat and then deal with the lower quality or the other quality habitat through the impact side. Like be picky on these projects, don't approve low quality bad mitigation projects and then feel frustrated that credits are being sold off of it. Let's, let's go after the high quality, you know, habitat projects. And also uh, is riverine systems related to wetland regulation or is it related to species? Well, I, I don't, I didn't know the difference there. And hey, Kelly, how are you? There we go, mic down. Um, so that was my comment and um, we are, working through certification process um, on a bank on the lower Columbia River in Washington State. Um, we have three credit types uh, under development. ESA listed fish uh, credits, those are coming out in the form of DSAs, wetland credits, and Oregon white oak credits, which is a habitat that is regulated under the local um, Growth Management Act. So one of the types of impacts that we're seeing is things like a pile or dolphin replacements on the main stem Columbia River, overwater structures, um, and some, you know, bank armoring or uh, things that don't necessarily have a big footprint when you're talking about two-dimensional measurements. Acres are two-dimensional. You're talking about a volumetric habitat, right? It's something that takes up three-dimensional space. And so you're underestimating impacts if you're looking at two-dimensional measurements like acres. And so we've been working through this very uh, sticky issue of um, what do what what is your currency? What are you measuring? Um, and two dimensions doesn't always get at the full uh, impact of projects that don't have a big footprint. Um, I don't. I don't have a simple answer. It's kind of a longer conversation and I'm- No, I think, um, I, I get it. I think what you're talking about is your site is just small, quite frankly, not that- No, our small. site is almost a thousand acres. But actually. big then. Our bank is big, but the impacts- credits then. The, the, the impacts that we're seeing, um, if you measure the footprint of 20 12 inch pilings, that is under, uh, representing the true impact of those pilings if you're only measuring them on a per acre basis. Right. So that to me is more of a regulatory issue, I would say, where, I mean, you're in a market now and this is, I, I can see exactly where this is going on your project. You have a massive, cool thousand acre project that's going to cost gobs of money. And then when you look at the, the market side of it, you're like, wait a minute, they're going to throw like four pennies at us every 20 years. I mean, that's scary as heck, right? So, <laughs> I'm glad you I, don't talk to my, <laughs> sorry. my funders because you would send them running the other way. You are not allowed to talk to anybody no, here. I'm the worst Travis. guy to talk to investors. <laughs> don't have me talk to them, I that's swear. But, no, but I mean, it is. So you're trying to match up this. Yeah. you know, apples for apples. And we're really, it's a sea change in how things have been approached because, you know, you'd get people with a project and they're like, oh, just put a few, you know, uh, pieces of woody debris yeah. in there. That's and you're right. like, that is not mitigation. 
and yeah. you have no quantification for so yeah. we've spent years working through trying to like you just said create a market create a currency yeah. uh you know we're just trying to talk apples to apples in right. terms of how things are being evaluated with impacts and it is well, not for the faint of heart uh and it is not for those without resources uh, so, but it can be done maybe i'm no, a unicorn I, no, I, I'll get, so I told you I'd give you investing advice and you probably already know this, but you've got some ESA fish credits hanging in there, right? NOAA Fisheries has taken a pretty active role in the banking program and I'm very impressed with some of their work. They're very interested in making this tool work. If that's true, and I think it is, on the impact side, you might be getting more of a market on your fish credits. Make sure you price those accordingly uh, for your project, because I think that's going to be your value in that type of project is probably your fish credits, definitely your wetland credits if you're doing any level of construction and if the core, you know, actually starts um, looking at impacts for temporary impacts or they expand, you know, the mitigation need there. But um, I would say your fish credits are going to be your money maker for sure. Uh, the white oak is interesting to me. That must be a state. Is that a state issue? Yeah. And are states giving like local permits out and requiring offsets for white oak? Is that how it works? So it's a habitat that is um, called a priority habitat by the state, but it's actually regulated by the local jurisdiction. So your oh, okay. city or county under the Growth Management Act has to protect these priority habitats. And hmm. so it is actually um, the county that is requiring uh, that mitigation. So have the county collect a fee that is directed then to your project and make sure you have them collect the fee at the amount that you need to sort of, uh, you know, take care of your white oak credits. The county has been really proactive in actually creating, um, we're the second bank that will have oak credits. Okay. Um, and they, they came to us and said, we need oak credits. And we said, we'll make oak credits. Got so it. We've we'll been, find uh, out what the other guys are charging problem. and then undercut them by 20%. I mean, that's clearly the <laughs> easiest way to do it. All right, guys. Well, I think we'd like to talk to Kelly probably more offline. And I want to give one of our um, uh, steering committee members a chance to ask a question. Craig Denisoff has a couple questions here, including an update on the Eco Challenge. Craig, or can, you, um, can you speak? Or should yeah. I read your question? Okay, Craig uncharacteristically can't speak. Oh boy, real so, fast, so real just, Doug, I gotta, I gotta break in because he said eco challenge and I just, give me two seconds here to explain this. So my lovely wife is on this phone call and she's an environmental consultant. And by the way, she's doing some really cool stuff related to stormwater crediting in San Diego. She and George Kelly should actually go have coffee because I think George Kelly is really big into stormwater. She needs help, but she's working on San Diego stormwater credits. But that being said, my wife was on a show called Eco Challenge with Bear Grylls, and she raced 400 miles in 10 days on a TV show on Amazon Prime. So you can watch my wife and her team. It's a total bunch of drama. It's all made for TV. But my lovely wife was on a team of four people, and they traveled in Fiji on boat, bike, running, you name it, uh, in the jungle. So she did that for 10 days, 400 miles, Bear Grylls. I got to give Bear Grylls a hug and he smells wonderful and he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. so anyway. and, and this is why Travis has to work so hard is because that one, ep that one episode of our life cost, you know, $100,000, I think. Just no, it didn't cost us $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. You know that me being in a race was going to bankrupt them. <laughs> it almost did. Yeah, maybe that's a credit sale right there. Anyway, so the, his question actually is, um, so Craig is asking, you know, we are confusing supply side, so, you know, supply side bank of ledger acre per acre versus demand side impact side that often has higher ratios, which is standard for most species. And also there's a reason that DSA markets, the HIA markets, and values are so hard to quantify and hence have fewer banks. I don't know, I, there's a lot to unpack there with Craig's comment and Travis, you wanna try a little something? Yeah, I think what he's just, and what I appreciate Craig saying is, you know, the, 
the the banking side or the offset side, if we keep that like acre for acre, we know that's solid habitat, that the demand side, which is where the regulators come in and they apply ratios to an impact, and that's where you get a bigger supply. And so less focus on sort of the the any confusion on the habitat offset side more focus on the regulators making sure the ratios appropriately uh, sort of add, basically add sort of demand, I guess, uh, for credits. So leave it, on, leave it to the regulators to make sure that when they're analyzing impacts, there might be an associated ratio that needs to be applied to that. So one acre of impact might be three acres of mitigation uh, would be a benefit to the industry to make sure that investments are sort of recovered. Great. All right, we're, we're a little over time. Travis, thank you for kicking us off so well. And thank you so much everyone for logging on and hope to see you next month. And it's gonna be hard to follow Travis, but I think we have a, somebody who can really follow Travis and, and keep this going. And if I can't find a speaker, I might have to give a presentation. So hopefully somebody will step in so I don't have to talk. Um, so again, thank you so much. And um, and we'll we'll see you next month. Next next month. Okay. Let awesome. me know if you have further questions. Thanks, and I'd love to have everybody's email. Or if you have questions, you can obviously follow up with me. I know Doug's going to be collecting questions, but um, I, I love obviously I love talking about this stuff. So uh, look forward to future conversations. Thanks, everyone.